15. Uncovering the Springs An unholy prudery prevents the church today from reckoning with many laws. An important example of this is the law concerning sexual relations with a menstruous woman or with a woman not fully recovered from childbirth. If the sexual relations with a menstruating woman are unknowingly performed, it is merely a ritual uncleanness requiring purification but carrying no moral penalty. Leviticus 15.24. On the other hand, the deliberate act is a serious offense. Also, thou shalt not approach unto a woman to uncover her nakedness, as long as she is put apart for her uncleanness. Leviticus 18.19. And if a man shall lie with a woman having her sickness, and shall uncover her nakedness, he hath discovered her fountain, and she hath uncovered the fountain of her blood, and both of them shall be cut off from among the people. Leviticus 20.18. The cutting off from among the people is read by some as the death penalty, by most as excommunication. Clearly, we are dealing with a serious and significant offense. It is one of the offenses which leads to a sickened land and a revolted nature. This is not only an offense against God, but one of the offenses which leads the earth itself to spew out a people. Leviticus 20 verse 22. The offense of having uncovered the fountain of her blood means that the man has exposed her life spring. Both the man and the woman are alike guilty. Ezekiel's reference to the same sin throws a further light on this matter. But if a man be just, and do that which is lawful and right, and hath not eaten upon the mountains, neither hath lifted up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, neither hath defiled his neighbor's wife, neither hath come near to a menstruous woman, and hath not oppressed any, but hath restored to the debtor his pledge, hath spoiled none by violence, hath given his bread to the hungry, and hath covered the naked with a garment. He that hath not given forth upon usury, neither hath taken any increase, that hath withdrawn his hand from iniquity, hath executed true judgment between man and man, hath walked in my statutes, and hath kept my judgments, to deal truly. He is just. He shall surely live, saith the Lord God. Ezekiel 18, 5-9. Two things appear from these passages. First, sexual intercourse with a menstruous woman, or a woman before her recovery from childbirth, is classified by both Leviticus and Ezekiel with serious, aggressive acts. Second, this act is listed prominently among those which pollute a land. Ellison's comment here is very much to the point. Quote, the fact is that the popular modern conception of the individual is derived from Greek thought rather than from the Bible, and may even be regarded as anti-biblical. We tend to think of our bodies giving us our individuality and separating us one from the other. In the Old Testament, it is our flesh— a word for body hardly exists in Hebrew, that binds us to our fellow men. It is our personal responsibility to God that gives us our individuality. Since man, Adam, is bound to the ground, Adama, from which he has been taken, and through it to all who live on the same ground, he cannot help influencing them by his actions. Abominable conduct causes the land to sin, Deuteronomy 24.4, compare with Jeremiah 3, 1 and 9. That is why drought, pestilence, earthquake, etc. are for the Old Testament the entirely natural punishment of wickedness. Compare Psalm 107, verse 33 and following. If a man dwelt in a polluted land, he could not help sharing in its pollution. The chief terror of exile was not that the land of exile was outside the control of Jehovah, a view that was probably held by very few, but rather that it was an unclean land, Amos 7.17. To return to the details of the law, first, seven days of abstinence from sexual intercourse is required during the time of menstruation. Leviticus 15.19, or if there is an ailment associated with menstruation as long as the discharge lasts. Leviticus 15.25. Second, the period of abstinence after the birth of a man-child is 40 days, Leviticus 12.2-4, and 80 days after the birth of a girl, Leviticus 12.5. We have cited two characteristics of this sin, that is, that it is an aggressive act, and that it pollutes the land. A third aspect is cited by Ezekiel 22.10, its perversity. 
Ezekiel associated it with sexual intercourse with a stepmother, and he spoke of it as a humbling of women. This writer's pastoral experience abundantly confirmed the element of perversity in this act. It is a delight to perverse men if the act is morally and or aesthetically offensive to their wife, and similarly, some women are interested in it if it is morally and or aesthetically offensive to their husbands. It is an attractive act only to those who want to sin against the other person and against God. To return to Leviticus 20 verse 18, the sin of the man is described thus, he has exposed her fountain. The sin of the woman is similarly described. She has exposed the fountain of her blood. Berkeley version. The term fountain is an important one here. In the natural, literal sense, it is a natural source of living water, and it is the same word as I in Hebrew. The word is also used symbolically in Scripture of God, Psalm 36 9, Jeremiah 17 13, as the source of grace, Psalm 87 7. There are a number of such references to God and Christ, but fountain is also used of Israel as the father of a great people, Deuteronomy 33.28. It is used of a good wife, Proverbs 5.18, and of spiritual wisdom, Proverbs 16.22 and 18.4. Its usage in Leviticus 20 verse 18 obviously combines graphically a literal and a symbolic meaning. To understand this meaning, we must remember that a fountain is a source, a place on earth where living water comes forth. There is an obvious analogy to the woman's ovulation. Equally obvious is the fact that there is a symbolic sense to the term here that is basic to the severity of the punishment. This meaning can be fathomed by stating the matter legally. It is forbidden to a man to uncover the fountain of a woman, and it is forbidden to a woman to uncover her fountain. This law thus placed the woman beyond the man's use for regular intervals of time. Similarly, the woman had no right to commit herself to a man without limits or without reservation. Man is God's creature, and God is the ultimate fountain of life. Man cannot transgress on any area because every area of life is bound and covered by God's law and is to be discovered or uncovered in him. Man's lordship is under God, and man cannot therefore exercise an unreserved lordship over anyone or anything. There is thus in all things a private domain which man cannot transgress. The public domain of things and of people is that covered by God's law. No man can thus make a woman his creature, nor can any woman make herself a man's creature. Every man and every woman has those obligations of love and service to husband or wife, to parents and children, employers, employees, and neighbors that God's law requires, but no transgression of the privacy of another person. Our fountains are in God. He alone, therefore, has the total right and power to unrestricted knowledge of us and jurisdiction over us. No man can claim that right without striking at God. Even though we may love deeply a wife, husband, child, parent, or friend, we cannot have a total relationship with them or transgress on their privacy or throw open ours without reserve. Similarly, the state has no right to total knowledge over its citizens, or to attempt to transgress the privacy of its citizens. It must claim their obedience to law, but no more. No man and no state can claim the power to do with people as it wills. But it is a characteristic of ungodly man to use man in terms of his own will rather than God's law. The Thirty Years' War saw the ruthless and total destruction of cities, villages, and farms by both sides. Engravings of the period show us the horrors of the war. Soldiers castrating farmers, hanging them head downward over the fire, and lining up to rape the farmer's wife. There was no restraint on the evil imaginations and actions of men. The great iniquity of the reign of Louis XIV was his treatment of the Huguenots. To have killed them for their faith would at least have been to honor it, but the policy instead was to quarter troops of the lowest kind of soldiers on the Huguenot families to rape their womenfolk. Napoleon showed better sense, and a contemporary account, that of the Marquis de Bonneval, reported it, quote, Surgeon Major Mouton of the Guard was billeted on the Princess of Liechtenstein. Mouton, whose soldierly language was often far from choice, wrote the princess a letter complaining of the sleeping arrangements and that in terms which were really insolent, all but indecent. 
This letter fell into the hands of the Prince of Neuchâtel, who took it to the Emperor. Napoleon's wrath knew no bounds. He ordered the Prince of Neuchâtel to produce the culprit at the following day's review between four gendarmes. The courtyard of Schönbrunn, much larger than that of Fontainebleau, has likewise a double flight of steps in front of the palace. The guards having massed in this courtyard, the culprit was led in by his four gendarmes. Then Napoleon showed himself on the perron with a paper in his hand. But instead of coming down four steps at a time, as he usually did, he advanced deliberately, followed by the whole of his brilliant staff, and still with the terrible paper in his hand. Still, with measured step, he approached the culprit and flung at him, Was it you that signed such filth? The wretched man hung his head by way of assent. Then Napoleon, in ringing tones, Understand this, gentlemen. One kills men, but one never puts them to shame. Let him be shot. The exhibition had been given, and General Dorsen did not have the unlucky doctor shot. End quote. If scripture does not give the power to use a person apart from the law to a husband or wife whose relationship is one of love, how much less does it permit any other to transgress on what is God's private domain in the life of man? If a husband cannot quote-unquote use his wife apart from the law, or a wife give herself apart from the law, no other man or agency can transgress on the fountains of life without polluting the very earth and incurring judgment. 